Right, while everyone's still finding seats, I want to give a big shout out to Blue Box. And the reason for that is that we, we thought we might be full this morning, and so we asked Blue Box if they would allow us to stream this presentation out to the video wall, and they very kindly agreed. Uh, we, we haven't been able to organize that with the OpenStack Foundation, but I still wanted to appreciate and give a shout out of appreciation to the good guys at, uh, at Blue Box for uh, making that possible for us. So we still have, looks like, five seats. Mark? Five. No, I think we're good. Early bird. Right. Very good. Let's get started. Uh, bienvenue. It is fantastic to be here in Paris. Oh, I'm so glad that's not the AV system. <laughs> right, it's great to be here in Paris. I want to thank the Foundation for choosing such a wonderful city. Uh, I hope you guys have all had a wonderful first day of ODS, first day and a half of ODS, and that the conversations here are everything that you hoped they would be. Um, uh, I must say that being in this kind of environment has really sort of raised the quality of, of thoughtfulness and, cal and the caliber of conversation uh, amongst all of the different vendors and participants in the forum. Uh, um, without further ado, I would like to dive straight into what will be an overview of uh, a series of presentations which we'll be holding in this room over the next couple of hours. Um, I hope to uh, show you uh, some of the extraordinary things that OpenStack is now capable of doing and some of the extraordinary things that uh, people are doing with OpenStack. Um, now, those of you who have... Who's been to a canonical keynote before? A couple of folks. Okay, so we have a tradition. And that tradition is that every six months at ODS, we celebrate the extraordinary progress that OpenStack has made, and also the progress that's been made in the Ubuntu community and by Canonical, in terms of what's, what OpenStack is capable of, and also in terms of how we've, easy we've made it to use, by doing a live demonstration on stage of a deploy on bare metal of OpenStack. Now, this is why I am very gray, because doing this every six months is some, somewhat terrifying. Um, it is sort of live acrobatics in front of a studio audience, um, some of whom don't wish for us to succeed, uh, although I always get the impression most people are cheering for us. Well, today is the summit of that journey, uh, and today uh, is kind of a milestone for all of us, because uh, my little secret is that every time we've done it, we've never needed it, but every time we've done it in the past, I've had a safety net. Uh, one of my colleagues sitting behind the curtain who would be able, if necessary, if I push the wrong button, to, uh, to quietly make things sort of uh, move forward in the direction planned. Now, we've never used that, but I've got to tell you, it was the only thing that kept my heart still beating as we went into canonical keynotes. Anyway, today I, I feel sort of relaxed about this because I'm not going to deploy a cloud. And in fact, uh, none of my colleagues are going to deploy a cloud. But if you would be so kind, one of you will deploy an OpenStack cloud live on stage in front of everybody else. Now, to make sure that this is not a plant, I'm going to ask someone to throw a hopefully not very well-made paper airplane into the crowd. Uh, you don't look like... Throw it anywhere you want, any, any direction. Hopefully it won't go very far. And if you work, whoever receives it... <laughs> and so moving right along. Uh, go, go, go ahead, however you, want to pick, however you want to pick a random volunteer, and if you... This is not working out well, Mark. Live demos, ladies and gentlemen. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'll tell you what. Wait, wait, wait. I think we can improve the aerodynamics of this structure, mainly by doing this and just um, throwing it that way. Now, if, if, if you work for Canonical or you know what's coming, then throw it away. Pass it on. You don't? You, you want to come up on stage. You don't have to come on stage. Pass it on anyway. Well, why not? Throw it in a random direction. You're going to come up? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, 
my name is Russell. Um, I've recently moved into the world of IT infrastructure. I work as a systems engineer, so I'm just sort of getting into um, understanding what cloud's all about, really. Sounds good. How are you liking Paris? It's good. All right. And um, have you ever compiled your own kernel? No. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> so, have you ever installed OpenStack? No. Brilliant. Would you like to? Yeah. Okay. Do you get stage fright? Not massively. Are you nervous? Mm, well, I've got to tell you something. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but come over here. Let's have a look. So, have you ever been to Texas? No. All right. So, I'm going to teleport you to Texas through this thing called the internet. It's a system of tubes. Okay. <laughs> Not there. Here we go. So, this is the University of San Antonio in Texas. University of Texas in San Antonio. And they've very kindly made available to us 76 machines of all sorts, just random hardware. A bunch of it is OCP hardware. Uh, there's some AMD C Micro. There's an AMD C Micro chassis in the mix over there. But it's a nice, healthy, random mix of stuff that we could cobble together. Um, and all of those machines, except for one, are switched off with no operating systems installed. And in the course of the next little while, you're going to build an OpenStack cloud. Um, how's your chef? Non-existent. How's your puppet? Same. <laughs> <laughs> How's your web browser? I can do that. All right, good. So uh, that's Maz. Everybody know what Maz do does? Maz is metal as a service. So it essentially just does all of the pixie booting and BMC management and operating system installation, all of that base data center management stuff like software-defined infrastructure. And then on top of that, normally we would layer Juju to orchestrate all kinds of different things. But what we're going to do here is point the the canonical uh, OpenStack autopilot, which is here, um, at that MAS. So, you know, just zoom out a little bit. So this is Landscape. It's our standard uh, systems management software for Ubuntu. Uh, and this is the now in beta, now in public beta, OpenStack installer. So all we've done is one of those machines is switched on and it's got Landscape installed, and we've pointed it at MAS. And you can see that down here. So it says we've got we registered a MAS region controller, we can talk to it. We've got at least five machines in there, and at least one of them has multiple disks and multiple network connections. That's a whole neutron thing. Right. My only clue is that that button over there starts the process. All right. If you have to ask any questions, ask them. I'm not allowed to say anything. <laughs> OK. Here you go. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an interesting thing, right? That's not from browser history. That's MAS, which knows the network and server layout, and it's telling landscape, these are the networks, networks you could use for your public gateways. Uh, and, it, and it knows the IP address ranges, so it's telling him which ranges will work for his external neutron gateways. Oh, you guys are so boring. <laughs> but it's a good choice. Don't get clever now. <laughs> all right, so wh wh what's happened is Landscape has gone to Maz, and Maz has given it a list of all of the machines that Landscape thinks could be useful for this cloud, and they're pre-selected. So you could deselect them, or you could leave them all there. Depends how big the cloud is that you want to make. Up to you. Oh, big cloud. Okay. <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> Et voila. Now, thank you very much, Russell. That's all there is to it. Um, so. That software is available now. I guarantee you all you need to do is set up MAS, which is straightforward. Pixie boot all your servers off MAS once. Uh, you use a standard script to deploy Landscape on that, and then you point Landscape back at MAS. And you can use the rest of your hardware to build an OpenStack cloud. Now, the reason we've done this is because right now, OpenStack deployments are largely limited by the number of OpenStack consultants in the world. Uh, consulting is really expensive, right? Uh, and it's expensive twice. It's expensive 
the, f uh, uh, the, the first time when you get those consultants and you have to get the good ones and you have to get them uh, um, on time. Um, uh, and then it's expensive every time you want to upgrade or change that cloud. So what we wanted to do is to say for folks who trust us to build a great reference cloud, uh, we wanted to be able to automate that process so that you can do it in your own data center with no consulting whatsoever. So we really dramatically reduce the cost to people of just getting a standard reference cloud. Uh, because that's built into landscape, of course, it also comes with all of the management, the systems management for those underlying hosts and guests, the Ubuntu hosts and guests. Uh, you would use your normal management software for other operating systems that you mixed in. Um, and there are a couple of cool things about that. We will evolve that reference architecture. Now, our reference architecture at the moment, we're going to do a walkthrough of that reference architecture at 5.30 p.m. here today. We'll share everything that we've learned about how to do a great OpenStack deploy. We've done this at some of the very largest institutions of the world. Um, and we'd love for you to reproduce that on CentOS or RHEL or SUSE or VMware, any, any, any platform you like. So we'll share what we've learned. Um, but we wanted to encode what we've learned in a place where people could just say, just give me what Canonical knows. And that's what this autopilot is all about. And the cool thing is, as we learn more, we will update that. You update landscape, you push the button, and your cloud will evolve to the latest, greatest reference architecture. So I think that's pretty cool. The problem with reference architectures and standard products, though, is that they tend to limit the number of choices you have. And I hope you saw there that, in fact, we've, we've started to give people all the, the commonly trusted choices in OpenStack. And of course, we want to extend that because um, we want this to be a reference architecture that is uniquely flexible and customizable and shows our partnerships with a number of vendors in, in, in the world. Uh, you may have heard of OIL, the OpenStack Interop Lab, and I'm delighted that there are now 26 global vendors who are part of the Interop Lab. And what we do, there's a talk uh, a little bit later, I think that's at um, 3.40. Um, uh, I've got times over here. Sorry, that's at 2.50. Uh, what we do is uh, we build a OpenStack 100 different ways every day, 3,000 um, builds every month. We run 32,000 tests of OpenStack every day in this Interop Lab. And as these vendors' code um, essentially goes through that validation process, at the end of that, we will certify it. And if those vendors want, we will add their code, their plugins, their extensions, and so on to this reference architecture standard installer. So you'll be able to make the choices that Russell made, except you'll have a bunch more options. And I'm delighted to give you a preview of Open Contrail from Juniper, which we expect to land in this autopilot uh, just in a few months' time, so during the course of the cycle. Um, if you look at this list of um, oil vendors, one of, the th one of the things that I'm really proud of is that we really have attracted the majority of the SDN vendors um, to oil. And so we, we really are, are, are serving as a, as a platform for interoperability testing. We're able to say, okay, for a given SDN, let's test all of the storage options, let's test all of the hypervisor options and the permutations and combinations of that, and then give feedback to those SDN vendors um, as to their interoperability with all of those other choices that you might make. Uh, and that's come about because of a strong focus on our part uh, on the telco market. Uh, there is a talk later on today um, at 3.40 here um, on SDN and NFV. So those of you who are, have heard a lot about NFV but are interested to see live demos of telco applications being deployed, live onto clouds, which you can interact with, um, show you a little bit of the work that we're being asked to do on behalf of telcos to help SNFE vendors integrate their stuff with each other. We obviously use Juju for live integration and deployment onto OpenStack and any other cloud or bare metal. Um, and all of that we'll, we'll be deep diving on SDN and NFE at uh, 3.40 this afternoon. Um, okay, so. All of this is in the name of helping you go faster, whether you're a vendor or whether you're a customer. A, a year ago in Hong Kong, we talked a lot about the telco industry because at that time we were seeing telcos as the lead investors in OpenStack. Um, and that's really why you see such a strong SDN presence on Ubuntu and with uh, Canonical um, and strong NFV presence there. Uh, then six months ago, we talked about work that we were doing with the banking industry. And I'm delighted that those projects have continued to grow and we're now 
um, well represented. Oh, sorry, I should say our, we, we've had a bunch more telcos join, the most recent of which was Wing Cloud uh, in China. And we're delighted to have them on board uh, as, as, a, as a partner. Uh, in banking, we've continued to grow. We now have a number of projects on Wall Street and uh, in London and around the world. And, and banks really are pushing our security story uh, forward um, to, to ensure the complete isolation of the infrastructure from workloads and so on, and also pushing performance. We've done a lot of work with the banking industry on, uh, on containers and OpenStack, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in the, in, in, in the current phase, what we're seeing that's really interesting is tremendous acceleration with media companies. Now, media companies are a perfect fit for OpenStack um, for a bunch of reasons. First, their workloads are typically very scale-out friendly, right? A lot of transcoding, a lot of streaming. Uh, and they're also a great fit for Juju, because if you think about what a TV station does, it's launching new shows and properties um, every quarter. And you never know which of those is going to be a hit. So it'll have huge amounts of traffic, which of those will be a miss and not have a lot of traffic. You don't know if they're going to last a year or 10 years. And so you need a really elastic infrastructure, and you're doing repetitive work setting up for each new show, websites, SMS gateways, competitions, uh, forums, fan sites, and so on. Uh, and so that r repetitive, rapid deployment of, of best practice stuff is really is a great fit for Juju. Now, I wanted to highlight one of our um, uh, customers and partners, folks who've taught us a lot, um, in, in the last couple of months, uh, and, and whose um, focus on scale out I've really come to appreciate, and that's Sky. So, um, a few words from uh, Sky about their engagement with OpenStack. One of the fantastic things about Sky is we are continuing to innovate and push the boundaries in the way that we bring products to our customers and bring content to our customers. When we started our private cloud initiative, we wanted to be disruptive um, for a number of reasons, but Principally, we wanted to pick a selection of technologies, both from a hardware perspective and a software perspective, that were best in class, that would make sure that our cloud was designed from the ground up to be what we wanted it to be. The main characteristics we were looking for is a sustainable cost base, so a price tag for the cloud platform that makes it effective and viable at scale. We needed a platform that was obviously robust and scalable, um, and also a platform that brings innovation and the fast pace of innovation around OpenStack. Ubuntu helps us meet those and, and more importantly realise those because of that broad range of experience that Canonical bring to the deployment. Canonical has helped us understand how we engineer those characteristics into the platform from the ground up and then how we most importantly maintain them moving forward. To look at the risk is also key. So for us, OpenStack it was risky. You know, there's many successful deployments, but there's also many failed deployments. Partnering with Canonical and Ubuntu, bringing their expertise in with our own engineering teams, we would ensure that that would de-risk the project as much as possible. Juju and Mass are critical for helping us build and deploy and manage the cloud environment because automation is one of the core benefits and core objectives of us from our private cloud initiatives. Without tools such as Juju and Mass, we'd have more people doing things, more manual processes, more manual tasks. So having this ecosystem of tools to help us deliver automation all the way through from tin to software is critical. So the name of that project actually is the Linear Scale Data Center, and I think it, it shows the insight that they have. They really are trying to restructure their operations to fit the economics of the 21st century. And, and the wisdom, you know, there was, lo I think, lots of interesting stuff there, but, but um, he called out economics. And, you know, this is something that we think a great deal about, right? Um, OpenStack is, is really only going to work if it is economical in the 21st century for people to run private clouds. You know, there's a hard limit because of the public cloud and the excellent work that's been done in the public cloud. There's a hard limit on the economics um, for OpenStack. And so you know, we try really hard to, to walk a fine line. We know we've got to be sustainable. We know we've got to um, be able to pr make long-term promises to customers. We also know that those customers have to, have to be confident that in the long term, the economics of building on OpenStack with us um, are going to be highly competitive and advantageous to, uh, to, to, um, to them compared to the public cloud. And that's a really, that's a really good discipline to have, I think, in, in many ways. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of a map of the way we engage with folks around OpenStack today. Um, that's not it. That's not it either. Ah, you know what? I magically hit the wrong key. This is like an IQ test, and I don't think I'm passing. But I pressed the right button. Yeah. Phew. 
Um, so the first thing we try to establish is whether somebody is really focused on the cloud as the opportunity in its own right. So for example, telcos who are going to offer cloud services, for them, being way ahead of the curve on the cloud itself is really important. And those are kind of like Formula One type engagements because we really, with them, we've got to learn a lot, we've got to push forward um, on the science uh, of the cloud, of the scale of the cloud, of the performance of the cloud. Uh, on, on the other end of the spectrum, we have folks for whom the cloud is merely a way to ensure that they can continue their operations in the security of their own data centers and their own environments. And so really that boils to, to sort of a, on the spectrum of tending to reference or tending to the, to the extreme. Uh, so on the reference front, you saw the autopilot, right? So our goal there really is to reduce the costs of a reference cloud to simply the cost of supporting the Linux platform. Uh, so that's either $300 to $700 a node, or AZ pricing, uh, which we've announced previously is somewhere between $75 and $350K, depending on the scale of your AZ. But we, we know that we have to cap that cost because you're, you're thinking about private versus public cloud. Uh, for folks who have a short-term skills blockage, we also then are willing to actually build the cloud and operate the cloud until they have the team to operate it themselves. And so this is proving a very useful bridging function, right? So boot, stack, build, operate, and optionally transfer um, uh, is, is a quick way to get a, a standard reference cloud up and running, have us handle all of the backups and other operations, all the monitoring, while you staff up your open stack um, uh, skill space, either internally or recruiting, and then we transfer the keys and pull out our engineers. So that's all handled in your data center remotely on your hardware. And again, that's $15 a day or $5,000 per node for a full year. Typically, those are three to six month engagements while people ramp up and build their, their cloud. Um, for folks who want to go beyond the reference, um, we kind of break that into two categories. We think of it as tailored. Uh, and in the tailored case, really what we're doing is we're accelerating the roadmap. So say, for example, you want to work with an SDN vendor that's not yet in oil or work with an SDN vendor that's not yet in the autopilot, that's where we would go there. And essentially what we're saying is we'll do that necessary development for you at cost because it's in our interests to accelerate what would be in our roadmap anyway. For the Formula One guys, um, uh, it's a much more intense engagement. We have on-site staff. This is where I think consulting actually makes sense. It doesn't make sense if you just want a cloud to run your workloads. It makes sense if the cloud is your business and you want to be ahead of the curve on the cloud. So we're trying to make sure that we're only engaged with consultants and our partners are the sorts of consultants who can handle these Formula One type engagements. Right. Um, people often ask what our focus is in, in OpenStack and I hope, I hope you would agree that, that we've tried to be really thoughtful about where we go in OpenStack and what we what we work on at OpenStack. And this is how I think about it. Uh, what we have to prove to the world as an OpenStack community is the performance, reliability, and scalability of OpenStack. That is the question that's on the table now. Can you get to 500 nodes? Can you get to 5,000 nodes? Can you get to 50,000 nodes? That's the question that's on the table uh, at the moment. And that's really where we focus all of our energy. Um, and I think OpenStack is at a really important decision point in what it wants to be. There's some really uh, uh, deep questions at board level about what is the focus of the project. I think um, this is, the, this is the, a thought that I'd like to, to share. Um, I think it would be very good for OpenStack to, 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 to strongly say that the core of OpenStack is these four pieces. This is where we're focused. And the reason for that is we think everything else will come in time, right? Everything else will come in time. There are dynamics inside the project which are, I think, bringing too much code which has knock-on consequences for that core, right? Yeah, bullshit as a service, money as a service, junk as a service, right? Irrelevant vendor, bluff, puff, and distraction. And so we as a company are trying to focus very strongly and work with other people who focus very strongly on that core because if we get that right, then all of the innovation that's happening on EC2 and on other public clouds will come to OpenStack. And so we're not going to beat all of those startups with committee meetings, right? We're going we're to make a viable platform that brings that innovation to the private cloud. And so that's, that's the way we see it. Um, I hope folks appreciate that to work on that core, to, to work on the performance and reliability of that core, is 10 times more work per line of code, right? But I think it's 10 times more valuable 
per line of code. To give you some taste of the sort of stuff we do there, um, every six months we do a scale-out performance test of, uh, of the current release of OpenStack and then benchmark that against previous ones to see how we've done. And in this round, we worked with our partner, HP. Uh, thank you very much, HP, for making available a series of moonshot chassis. These are amazing, hyperscale, very dense, uh, new style, uh, 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 new architecture devices, very dense x86 and ARM cartridges. So we did this benchmarking on x86, um, and uh, we were able to hit, uh, we were able to deploy the cloud itself on a couple of hundred nodes, 500 odd nodes, um, in two and a half hours, which is a lot faster than we were able to do it um, six months ago. And we were able to hit 100,000 VMs, which is our target threshold, uh, in half the time that we were able to do it six months ago. So that's pretty good news. The other really good news is that Neutron has gotten much more scalable between Icehouse and Juno. So this is all Juno that I'm talking about. And that autopilot that I showed you, that's Juno as well. So if you use the autopilot, you get Juno, and you'll get upgrades to Kilo and M and beyond. Um, so that's the good news. Neutron is much more scalable. There's still work to be done there, particularly in that Neutron doesn't support cells. So at the moment, there is a hard limit on how far you can get with Neutron. But within the bounds of that, it's much, it's much faster. It's much more scalable. The bad news is we saw significant regressions in Nova, uh, in Nova scalability. And so we've, we've got some patches for that. We will um, apply those patches to the stable branches of Juno, um, which, we're, which we co-maintain. And we will um, make sure that everybody gets those. Uh, they are or will be in Ubuntu OpenStack as well, so they will be part of the autopilot installs that you do. Um, but I think it goes to show that when you've got development moving very fast, and when you've got many, many, many topics of conversation, when you've got many of developers working in, in kind of artificial environments like DevStack, that, that these scalability issues can creep in without anybody noticing. And so we, 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 are, we know we're doing continuous integration every day for correctness. We now want to look to do continuous integration uh, every day for scale. Take this sort of infrastructure and make it part of the CI, CD process to help catch those issues in OpenStack um, very, very early. Right. So that's it for, the, for OpenStack for the moment. Uh, but what are people doing on top? Well, who's heard of Docker? Yeah? Anybody not heard of Docker? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Docker is amazing. It is profoundly changing the way developers are pushing code into production. Um, it is the fastest, cleanest, neatest way for your devs to push their code into your production servers. And, uh, and I think it's amazing and kudos to, to Docker Inc. for the work that they've done there. Uh, I think everybody knows that Docker was born on Ubuntu and we continue to work really closely. And we work not only with Docker, but we're very passionate about the developers who are using Docker. Uh, so there are actually six times as many Docker images on Ubuntu as there are the next operating system in, in the list. Uh, and that gap is widening uh, because we continue to, to focus on whatever we need to do to make Ubuntu great for developers. So if you happen to be in a, develop, a developer in an institution which is fascinated by Docker but has a corporate policy that limits you to, shall I say, a legacy uh, Linux environment, um, you will be delighted to know that this is the new way for Ubuntu developers to get their code straight into production. We're seeing that all over the enterprise market as well. Um, one of my sort of passions is all of the things that are growing up around Docker. And you're seeing a whole explosion of different ways to command and control uh, Docker environments. Uh, there's Days, um, there is Flocker, there's a Fig from Docker Inc. itself. Uh, Panamax from CenturyLink, uh, Fleet from um, the great CoreOS guys. Um, there is Kubernetes from Google, Diego from Pivotal. Uh, this is a fantastic Cambrian explosion of innovation, and we should relish and, and celebrate it. Um, and I want to make sure, oh, and OpenShift, uh, who've said that they're going to rewrite again uh, to use Docker. Um, now, all of those, with the exception of OpenShift, um, have chosen Ubuntu as their target platform of choice. And I want to make sure that all of those are available to you on Ubuntu, and not just on Ubuntu, but instantly deployable with Juju. And I'd love to have OpenShift as well. Um, uh, now, yesterday we announced uh, that we were working with Google to put Ubuntu, reference images of Ubuntu, fully optimized on the Google Cloud, which is a great milestone for both of us. It's been a lot of fun working with Google. Uh, and today, I'd like to show you one of the fruits of that collaboration, um, which is Google's optimized Kubernetes, uh, which I'd like to deploy for you 
live on bare metal. Now, I don't think anybody's actually done this before until we did it, um, you know, and certainly not in front of a public audience. So uh, on this orange box, remember, in, inside here we've got 10 little Intel microservers, right? So I want to deploy live on stage Kubernetes to those boxes. Um, one of those boxes is, actually it's a VM on the, on, on, on the box that's running Maz, um, is running Juju, so that's the Juju GUI. Uh, I'm not going to use the command line at all, because Kubernetes is already in this repository over here. So all you have to do is spin up Juju on bare metal or on Azure or on GCE or EC2 or OpenStack, and off you go. You get this screen. You go in here and search for Kubernetes. Here it is. That's what a Kubernetes orchestration actually looks like. And hopefully, if I press this button, you'll start to see lights coming on, touch wood, on this machine over here. And that will be Maz being asked to provide Metal, uh, on which it's been asked to put Ubuntu. We now have banks deploying SUSE with Maz, uh, and other banks deploying RHEL with Maz. And yes, I'm glad to say banks deploying Ubuntu with Maz, and soon banks deploying Windows with Maz as well. Anyway, in this case, um, Maz deploying Ubuntu onto uh, new metal that's being requested over there, and then Ubuntu being installed onto that metal, and Kubernetes being installed onto that. And while we're waiting for it to come up, oh, you know what I haven't done? I don't think I've actually kicked it off. This is where the man behind the curtain might be really useful. <laughs> we'll come back to that one. Right. So Docker is absolutely amazing. And you're going to see an explosion of Docker command and control systems. And we're going to put all of that on Ubuntu, make it easily available on every cloud, Juju deployable, and with packages in Ubuntu. Um, but what else? Well. A lot of people, a lot of the, 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 one of the most exciting topics of conversation generally at the moment is around containers. Um, and many of you may know that Canonical leads the work at linuxcontainers.org, uh, which is where LXC, the general system container, is developed. So I want to talk a little bit about what's coming there. I want to announce that working together with that community, Canonical is going to lead the next big thing, which will be a new hypervisor purely focused on containers called LexD. Now, I'm calling it a hypervisor for a very specific reason. The things that you count on from a hypervisor are security. Well, Canonical has led uh, Mac-based security and SecOMP security and user namespaces security for LexC, and we're bringing all of that to LexD. In addition, we're working with silicon vendors to provide hardware-guaranteed isolation of containers so that all of the hardware guarantees that give you isolation guarantees in, in the chip in KVM will also be available to containers without the overhead of virtualization. And because we'll be LexD, we'll be a daemon, a small daemon written in Go that runs across many different machines, uh, we'll be able to do live migration of containers from machine to machine. Now, uh, in the spirit of taking our lives in our hands, if you want to uh, see that in action, stick around in this room, because at high noon, uh, Tycho and Dustin are going to take their lives in their hands and do a live migration of, uh, uh, of Linux containers from machine to machine. It's an awesome, awesome demo. So that's a taste of the future. Um, this is going to unleash uh, new levels of performance, for private clouds that are Linux on Linux. The one catch with containers is that it's Linux on Linux. If you want Windows, we're glad to give you Windows, but you'll have to put it in either KVM or ESX, which we'll fully support uh, uh, as well. So LexD, you heard it here first. OK, so clouds. Well, people don't build clouds. I don't know about you, but I don't think people build clouds because they like to see the blinking lights. And thank God, the lights are blinking. So, <laughs> oh, yes, we're starting to get a bit of Kubernetes. Whew, that's where it was. Um, so I don't think people build clouds for the blinking lights, right? They build it because they want answers. They build it because they want solutions. 
And so that's really what we're focused on now, working with multiple vendors. That's Kubernetes, uh, but in, in telecoms, there's a whole portfolio of solutions, NFE and otherwise, that we're being asked to accelerate the integration of and deliver with Juju onto clouds in a telecom-type environment. Um, in the media environment, it's the same. Um, and the one thread that comes up consistently in customer engagements, there are two threads that come up consistently. One is big data. Uh, and so I'm delighted to announce that over the next six months, we will bring to market solutions from three of the biggest big data companies in the world, MapR, uh, Hortonworks, and Cloudera. And of course, we're going to deliver all of those as a series of Juju charms so that you can deploy their solutions instantly on any cloud and on bare metal. Uh, now, the really cool thing about this is I gave this presentation of this to a financial industry technologists uh, event in London. And at the end, I showed Matt Barr and Horton and Apache Hadoop just spinning up. At the end of it, a guy put his hand up. He said, look, I don't have a question. I just want to bitch a bit, he said. Because if I'd known this six months ago, I could have saved myself the last six months because I've just spent six months deploying all of those solutions manually. And here we have them deployed instantly on any cloud or on bare metal. So for evaluation purposes, all of them have strengths uh, that, that might lead you to choose them in for your particular application. For evaluation purposes, this is going to be absolutely the best way to choose your big data or Apache Spark um, solution of choice. We're also working, of course, with um, application vendors who are delivering um, uh, intelligence on top of Hadoop, um, also as a series of Juju charms. And those are, um, and those are going to be demoed uh, later today over here. Um, uh, that will be in, um, at in this room at 4.40 p.m. So Cloud Foundry um, working with Pivotal and Hadoop working with all of the lead vendors. Now, I want to call something out here. Our goal is not to sort of muscle our way into these markets and compete with those vendors. You know, I don't know about you, but I really don't like it when a platform vendor feels it has to buy or um, uh, uh, compete with the people who've originated the technology. Because innovation is hard. Platform companies tend to have other problems, and so they don't innovate as much. And so I feel we have to accelerate those companies, and we have to let them bring their solutions to market. We have to let them compete and let them innovate. So that's our agenda. We're not entering the Cloud Foundry market with a canonical Cloud Foundry. We're supporting Pivotal, and we'll support other um, uh, PaaS and other institutions as well. We think Pivotal has the leading enterprise PaaS solution with Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, but we want to see all of that innovation happen. So we're not going to try and crowd it out. We want to accelerate them getting your, your ability to evaluate and choose their solutions and their ability to find uh, uh, customers whose expectations they can, they can really, really meet. OK. Um, uh, most clouds start with a particular application in mind. And I think that's really good, because if we know um, what your application is. We really can tune that architecture to accelerate that application. But one thing I've observed is that uh, a cloud gets built for a particular purpose, and if it's successful, the same developers then start to want to use the same cloud for other applications. And so there's kind of a trade-off, because on the one hand, you will get better results, um, better performance, and so on, if you optimize the cloud for your application. Now, if you know you're doing Hadoop, or you know you're doing Condor, or you know you're doing test and dev, then you would build a particular kind of cloud. But the reality is that over time, you have to be able to evolve to the general if you're going to be successful. And that's just one of the great things, I think, that, that we've developed, is the ability to, to build a cloud using t sort of mix and match components uh, with the architecture, the spread of services on metal that you want that's right for that thing, but then to evolve it over time. And I think that's a really useful and important characteristic. I think we're running out of oxygen in this room. Um, so I want to wrap up with an invitation to you and to your friends and colleagues. It's a great privilege for us to be um, working with Juniper. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone from Juniper in the room, but thank you very much for joining us in this. Um, for, to host people and invite people from OpenStack to one of the world's top five, and I think top one, um, art collections in the Musée d'Orsay, which I've probably mispronounced. Um, but it is an extraordinary place, and uh, there'll be no decks or pitches. Uh, champagne on Juniper, and uh, there'll be guides if you want to learn a little bit about the masters. But you know, in an evening, before dinner, before the other parties, you'll be able to see some of the art that you've almost certainly seen 
um, you know, th throughout your life. Incredible artists from an incredible diversity, um, uh, all in one place. So I hope you'll be able to join us. Please bring um, partners, spouses, friends, and uh, I hope you'll have a lovely evening together. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, right after this, right after the break, oh, actually, I think we have time for questions, which is the one thing we never had in a plenary keynote. Do we have time for a question? Well, we've got a man with his hand up. Go for it. Right. So I think the question is, you know, how, how are we going to make OpenStack something that works well in a, in a newly competitive environment? And especially if we're partnering with vendors who might be perceived to have expensive solutions. So the first thing is, you know, we, we're very mindful of the costs that we inject into the, into the equation. So we've tried to model those as being costs that will keep you um, economically productive on a private cloud in the face of competition from Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Facebook, well, not Facebook, Tencent and other mega data center operators. So we're very confident that our cost, the cost that we inject, will, will keep you well below the threshold and keep your private cloud economical in the face of that competition. Uh, other vendors that we introduce to that, um, I think are responding very well to the changing dynamics. You know, uh, uh, times change, technology changes, the rules of economics change, and companies change. Uh, as an example of that, you know, Microsoft, I think, is sincere in their commitment to running Linux on Azure. Right? That's an extraordinary shift, not just from the leadership, although I think it does come from the top, uh, with the support of the top, but also from the heart of the business. Now, I expect that all of the vendors that you saw on that page um, uh, 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 have plans, have strategies to be able to offer value. Right? They know that if they don't, they won't be around. Uh, and our job is simply to make it really easy for you to evaluate their solutions, choose the ones that work for you, including on the economics, and then build a reference cloud that includes those components, fully managed, to keep the costs down. Does that address your question? Great. Questions, Chris? I don't, I don't, I don't know, has it? Kubernetes is up. Kubernetes is up. Cool. Uh, those are the Maz. If I just reload that, you'll see a bunch of green. Those are the Maz machines. I'm going to go and... Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm just going to go and scale out Kubernetes quickly. Let's add another, if we've got another machine. You have to put one in the inner, put an integer right there. Right, so we just asked for another machine uh, for Kubernetes. Um, and that is the cloud installer in Texas progressing. So what it's currently doing is deploying RabbitMQ, deploying Keystone, Sephiroth Gateway, MySQL, OpenStack Dashboard. So it's spun up a bunch of those machines. It's got the operating system on them. It's now allocated which ones. It looks at the RAM, the number of cores, the number of network interfaces. It dynamically allocates the right interfaces to the right kinds of machines. It builds our reference architecture, and it's busy doing all of that. It will take... Um, it'll probably take another hour or so, because that's 76 machines, and they're not all super fast. Um, but when it's done, that will be a full uh, reference cloud, and you're welcome to come and bang on it um, from our booth in, in the trade show area. Any other questions? I think we're out of time. Last question. Uh, when will LXD come out, and can I use Juju to deploy my container? So first, it's not LXD. That sounds like a drug. It's LexD. <laughs> LexD. <laughs> LexD. Good. Um, LexD will come out over the next six months. Uh, we're, we're doing this properly as a, as a full open project. Um, uh, it's been written in Golang. It'll be um, commits to the standard LexC. See, LXC, nerdy. LexC, mm. LexC repositories under linuxcontainer.org. All right, thank you very much. Have a great day. I hope you're happy. Right. Awesome. Please. Please.